All right. So um, is my screen still being shared? Yeah. Yep. Okay, perfect. All righty. So, um, so just some house notes um, since we started recording. Um, I know we just we just went over the video. We don't have to go back over it. Um, but for in terms of consent, if folks are sharing anything and would like that not to be um, documented in text, please do um, let me know. You can say it, you know, as you start speaking, you can say, please don't write this down anywhere. Um, I'm probably going to go back to these bit, um, to this recording and pull some of what we discuss here um, to like throw into the zine that we're hope, you know, we're hoping to work towards. Um, so I would like to make sure that I am checking for consent in advance. Um, and what else do I have here? Um, also, this is a very collective project. So I do really want to honor folks. I want to honor your name as you would like to be called. Um, so if you want to throw that in the chat, um, if you want to write it directly in the notes, um, I've shared the notes. I'm going to share it one more time just in case some folks um, came afterwards. Um, feel free to write it down for us. That would be great. Um, I just want to make sure that, you know, we're honoring not just your words, but also this is data that you are giving to us and we want to make sure that it's recognized as such. Um, all right, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So I'm not going to um, linger long with the recap. Um, the main thing um, I do want to point out is, one, this deck is available in the notes and um, there's also a recording of it. Um, I've been told that I sound pretty robotic. I was coming off of COVID last time. Um, so I don't know if I'll be able to be that on theme um, this round, um, but you know, I'll do my best for y'all. Um, what else? And yeah, so just to recap really quickly, um, I'm not gonna dive too deeply into the definitions of black womanhood and cyborg since we spoke a lot about that last time. Um, but the main point is that um, in many ways, um, our like race is a technology, so is gender um, in the sense that they are used as tools to define, you know, how we end up being placed in society, what our realities are going to exist as and um, our experiences. And from that lens, Black women who are very much the opposite of the white men that most of this present reality was designed for um, are treated as subhuman oftentimes, well, almost always. Um, I don't know many instances where that's not the case. Um, and simultaneously, you know, both as, you know, being subhuman, um, there's this idea that we are tools um, to be utilized and purposed for different things. Um, and at the same time, we have to perform in very advanced capacities um, to be recognized as maybe potentially human. Um, so from that lens, really, this recognition of the word cyborg is not as much a, an acceptance of the term, but more of a recognition that this is the realities that we exist in. And if that is the case, then are there ways that we can recognize that that form of existence so that we could, um, you know, self-name and make more meaning and co-create, um, you know, for thriving, um, you know, rather than like trying to survive and what are some ways where we could thrive? And again, this would go back to the poem that we just explored um, a little bit. Um, so yeah, so if you go back to the last session, we walk a little bit deeper into what the definitions of technology, um, which are just any tools, um, innovation, as almost kind of a remembering oftentimes, um, we talk a little about ecology and spirituality, um, justice and liberation, and liberation I'm defining as things that um, help us feel more whole. Um, so, you know, as we saw in the poem, a lot of what she was describing was very much liberatory. So, you know, liberatory media would be literally a video that reminds us of like what it means to exist as liberated folks. Are there any thoughts on this, questions? Um, if you weren't here especially, um, I would love to hear, you know, thoughts. If you were here, I'd love to hear um, if anything new came to you between now and the last time as well.
I guess I, I appreciate the, you summarizing, re-summarizing the definition because I was so confused last time. But for some reason, like your explanation just now really made sense to me. And it, it made me kind of think about, I've been thinking, yeah, the other day I was listening to the woman who um, has the Instagram account, um, the Nap Ministry. And she was talking about how like, like we have this idea that we have to be productive in order to have value, but that we are just, and we don't really, a lot of people don't understand that people are valuable just in the mere fact that they exist and there's nothing that they have to do in order to prove themselves or to like gain value. And I think that, and then she was talking a little bit about the transatlantic slave trade and how that was the foundation of capitalism and how through, the, through that culture um, and, through the, and through that trauma, we have kind of, black people have kind of been like indoctrinated into thinking that our value and pro and our worth is just like inherently tied into our pro productivity. And so I, that just kind of connects, makes that connection to me as race being used as a technology and people being seen as tools. And, and I definitely can see that like we are kind of like a tool in this capitalistic wheel in order to just generate profit. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Paige, for sharing. Um, and Tracy just added in the chat um, a link as well to Nat Ministry. And um, okay, yeah, Matthew was inquiring about the Nat Ministry, correct? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's in the chat. Anybody else have any other thoughts of that? Um, or that builds on what Tracy just shared as well? I mean, not Tracy, Paige. Yeah, I think when you mentioned like race and gender being a technology, I'd never heard that before. And mm -hmm. so for me, I was like, oh, oh gosh. Yeah, like I've never thought of like race and gender. And so like the as like technologies, I mean, it, I think about it now, like, oh, like how it's been used against us, but then also how we use it to liberate ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so like now, like my brain is kind of like popping like fireworks, like, oh, that's a whole nother way of like thinking about things. So now I'm like intrigued about like how, where we're going to go with this and thinking about um, cyborgs. I've heard of the term cyborgs used in sort of critical disability text, um, but I hadn't heard it in this frame. So now I'm like, oh, okay, like now I'm kind of excited. Like, where are we going to go now? Yeah, thanks for sharing. That is definitely the goal. I think, um, you know, as somebody who has like um, study technology, one of the things that, you know, it took me a while to recognize is that in many ways how technology is framed was always outside of myself um, until I realized maybe it's because part of me is technology itself um, in the sense that like maybe I don't belong in like or I don't feel like I belong in these like tech spaces because of the fact that I'm part of the tech technology they de they're designing for. Um, so for example, right now, I know there's a lot of like incarceration, um, like technology that's being built of like, you know, more high tech versions of like ankle bracelets for um, like monitoring devices for folks that are out on bail, for example. And those are very much defined, designed in ways that, you know, they're you know, their, what is it called? Their user cases, the folks that they're designing, if, you know, to utilize it on um, or the purpose is often based on us or exclusive. It either, it, it's often for capitalizing on the masses overall. Um, and in many ways we are both excluded and considered as tools for that capitalization. 
Um, so yeah, so I'm really hoping we can explore that and also just access like what does technology mean to us? Like our technologies are equally valid as well. And that's one of the things I really wanna think about is, you know, what are our technologies? Is it just a video? Is it journaling or finding your old letters your parents used to write um, or whatever? Like those are also technologies because they are utilized for different means. Um, Chantal, I see that you asked, um, what tenants do you use to measure a state of being whole? Could you say more on that? And it's okay if you don't have anything more. Hi, um, I know you had mentioned, you'd use the word whole um, in your de definition. Um, or a place to arrive at and I was wondering more about like what ideas do you have around what it means to be whole um, in that pursuit yeah um so to be honest I I find I think of wholeness actually as something we're always um becoming we're always like trying to arrive at it's not necessarily something that you reach um you know similar to liberation I think there's many ways that, you know, once you think you've attained something, you can kind of like get stuck there. Um, so instead, I would, um, the way I would kind of like build on what you're inquiring is more, um, you know, what are some ways to become whole, to work towards becoming whole, um, to enter the process of, be, of, you know, working towards what that means to you. Um, that's a lot of that's what I'm going to explore a, you know, throughout the rest of the session. So um, I don't want to throw too much into that, but I would say um, wholeness is, you know, any things that feel good to you. Um, I always say the ways that I know something doesn't feel good is um, like there, you know, like when folks say like, you know, this ain't it, um, that is often like my measure. Like I don't feel when I feel like this is not it, like something's off um that is typically the reminder you know and sometimes you'll see you know somebody will say oh there's a new app I remember um at my university when they started doing like um I don't remember what they were doing but it was something to do with tracking um and I remember being like huh this is gonna go off and like a couple weeks later students had concerns around like um how you know what they plan to do with like the fingerprints that they were um that were being used um, so that recognition of like, well, that did not feel right in my body sometimes is usually like the best measure. Um, so I would say that is usually the main thing. Um, I'm going to explore some more of the stuff that I pulled both from um, the poem we reviewed earlier and other stuff as well um, to touch on that. Um, but did that at least answer your question for the time being? Yes, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, anybody else? Any other thoughts? Okay, so I'm gonna jump to the next slide. Um, and before I do, I'm actually remembering as well, um, I don't know if folks have read um, Toni Morrison's Beloved. Um, there's a quote in there, I don't remember the exact quote because I didn't have it, um, but it makes me think of wholeness um, where um, it's a quote that says, she gathers me and hands me back the pieces of myself that I lost. Um, so I would say wholeness is also recognizing pieces of yourself that maybe you left behind, you know, due to thinking you were supposed to be a machine and trying to, you know, build on productivity and recognizing your burnt out. Um, so, you know, those kind of measures of like, what does, what does not feel right and how do I get more right with myself as well? Um, that literally just crossed my mind. All right. So. Um, so for this session, um, some of what we're going to be exploring, again, media or like, you know, I, I think of media as like anything that serves as like a time capsule or a portal to specific realities. Um, you know, so again, like this recording is very much going to be that down the line. I'm sure folks will look back and, you know, consider many different things from what we're experiencing right now. Um, so some of the things I would like us to really think about throughout um, as we work through today's session is, you know, how can we envision liberation as technologies, strategies, and ideas 
that are purposed by Black women to experience wholeness. Um, and again, we center Black women as the very much the opposite of who our present realities were designed for, um, because they would then have the tools to help us access liberation, um, because they have to exist in this um, space. Um, next, we want to think about um, how can we acknowledge practices that align with and expand on freedom, um, and that is a freedom that is that manifests in our everyday life. You know, what what moments of freedom do we experience in our everyday ordinary lives? And those are the ones we want to build on. Um, trying to aim for the big, I find sometimes, at least for me, is very difficult. But if I can think of, let me pause and breathe. Um, let me take an extra second and you know, recognize myself. Um, so think of those kind of things. Um, and then also, how can we speculate on our existence as us living into, which is what I was saying um, earlier, Chantal, um, living into our legacies. Um, we are not necessarily, we don't ever necessarily arrive at things, um, but you know, how can we continue to become good ancestors to our descendants as well as the ecologies around us, um, which includes our communities, the earth as a whole, any body, things, beings in our ecosystem. Um, any questions on this? Okay. All right, so um, things I wanna explore. One, I wanna consider um, just remembering, um, you know, remembering liberation in a sense. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, so much of what I'm exploring here is grounded in Black womanhood, um, and that's Black womanhood in both a gender and sexuality expensive um, way. And um, the first thing I would say is, you know, defer to, the, to wisdom that's rooted in their lived and learned experiences. Um, so as the poem was saying, you know, um, what would her grandma do her grandma, you know, and, um, you know, what are some ways we can kind of seek out community and mentorship from each other? Um, how can we talk to our elders, our ancestors, um, the youth around us? Um, I like to think of the youth as, you know, ancestors that have returned for a purpose. So, you know, how can we center what they are saying to learn from them? Um, they often know more than we do um, because they're existing in almost completely different realities from us um, because in their realities, they haven't had the struggle that we have. Um, so they can very much remind us of those um, of our own um, sense of liberation. Um, I know, for example, um, my little one literally says um, they weren't, um, she wasn't around when I struggled with um, technology. Um, and, you know, it's really like interesting to hear that, but simultaneously, it reminds me that, you know, maybe technology should be free and should be high speed and you know, why is it such a thought? And maybe because I lived um, through like the dial-up age, um, you know, my idea of technology is like, oh, this is the best that we got. But for her, it's like very much like this, you know, this is limited because it's not free yet. Um, and that idea reminds me of what I should be striving towards. Um, so how can we value those um, knowledges that are learned from just living as well as just trying to live? Um, and um, and then simultaneously, you know, how can we assert and affirm the ordinary and everyday ideas and, and um, activities? So, you know, as I was saying earlier, um, change and transformation are very nonlinear. Um, so, you know, let's think of like routines that are very much strategies, you know, sometimes like the exact routines, the way that we do it is a strategy um, to subvert white supremacy. Um, some of the very things we think of as, you know, Oftentimes I remember like us calling things ghetto because that's not how it's supposed to come. But like if somebody literally got you all the tracks <laughs> for all the songs that you want on a CD for free, maybe that's, you know, liberatory. I'm not saying <laughs> let's not um, steal people's content, but it's still very much liberatory. You know, when we were like, at least for me, when I was in middle school, like I didn't have to ask my mama to buy me that CD and I still had it. Um, so, you know, let's think of like, what does that mean and how can we explore the things that we previously labeled as ghetto for like the pieces of innovation that's in them. Um, also, you know, thinking of like the most average parts of us are often what makes us the most whole. So like, what are the most average part of us? They're probably not the parts of us that we, you know, 
commodify and sell to companies so we can have a paycheck and pay our bills. They're often the parts of us that we leave to the side and we take care of um, when we have some time to ourselves. But those are the parts that remind us what homeless feels like. Um, and also, you know, in here, um, you know, as folks who are often called angry black women, um, you know, I want to affirm like we should be saying, you know, like, tell us what you really think, like, you know, be as loud about it as you need to be, because that garners attention. And, you know, there's, you know, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be silencing if there's no power in your voice. Um, yeah, so does anybody have any thoughts on that? Um, I see in the chat that Matthew said ghetto got replaced by ratchet and too many people a decade ago who should have known better um, were evoking it to refer to human beings. Yeah, very much so. And um, yeah, like, what does that mean? Any thoughts on that, on anything else I just shared? Um, thanks, Matthew. I would like to open it up to folks. And I see that Shawnee added in the chat um, that what Matthew said was very true. I think also to add to Matthew's statement, it's interesting because some of the things that have been considered air quotations or quotations ghetto or ratchet um, until they've been commodified by like white folks, it was deemed lower, right? But then once it became something that could be commodified or, you know, or appropriated, um, then it became something that was like, oh, this is cool. Like, for example, I saw something recently um, where like um, some uh, like putting Vaseline on your face, right? was something that, you know, you, you did to protect your skin, particularly like from like the cold weather and wind. And so that was something that was like, definitely within like, from what I know, like the black community, like you, you put Vaseline on your face and your legs, and it also gave you a sheen and a shine, right. <laughs> you know, you, you know, or whatever. Um, and so now it's become like this TikTok uh, trend called slogging, right? And so now it's become commodified where something that was, you know, deemed as lower um, at then is like now deemed higher because of who is doing it. And, mm -hmm. but it was our technology and how we've had to survive and thrive in our communities. And so it's, that's that part that's really, really interesting, um, you know, to think about. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Um, I think that was one of the main things that um, pushed me in this direction of um, trying to, you know, pull and construct like our realities was that experience, um, like being in grad school and studying innovation and recognizing that so much of what is being called innovative it's like but that's like how we live um for so many of us um you know just like in like random ideation state um sessions um of folks throwing out ideas as like brand new things um you know like maybe like the vaseline would have been thrown out of you know to say here's a way to protect your face when it's cold and like somebody would have pitched it and maybe even gotten a contract and meanwhile we're like sitting on these things that we're doing to liberate ourselves. And, you know, because we are not seen as fully human, we don't know to recognize ourselves as fully human and to recognize our innovative capacities in that way as well. Anyone else? Yeah, I just wanna say, I, re I appreciated this, the, the, um, this, like a suggestion that it became kind of commodified by white folks. Um, Sometimes when I've heard this, like, I kind of try to figure out like um, how to process it. It's almost like um, some of these slang terms are like um, culturally, like we own certain groups, own them. And then they're kind of transferred over to another group as if they were commodities themselves and products. 
And, and then like from going from like black folks using it to white folks using it, it kind of becomes pulled into like capitalism. And, and I, I, I kind of, a lot of times I, I do think we should kind of interrogate that these notions, because even when we talk about like ownership, like particular people own particular words and stuff, I think that we have internalized these ideas of like our cultural creations or like our capitalist products we have copyright on. And we should really kind of uh, reflect, kind of just question it, but I know that I have to kind of process it a lot. But the first time I guess I heard Ratchet was maybe like 15, 20 years ago. And it was a guy who was basically separating women into like, ratchets are like low quality women they're like psychopaths they're like got drug problems and then there are like the spartan women and you it's like kind of like a pickup artist thing like um like this is how you're supposed to it was a feminist friend of mine who shared it on facebook and i and it's like the, the whole idea is like you ratchets and get with like those high quality women, like kind of a pickup artist thing. And, and I was like, it was, it was really misogynist, but um, I remember like, I'd be like in Dunkin' Donuts and stuff like a few years later. And like, I'd hear like white folks, like saying, like siblings saying to each other, like, oh, that girl is so ratchet. And it was just, it's so gross, you know? And, and my, my sister once, she told me that she's so like, she says, Matthew, she says like, Isa Ray was on Oprah Winfrey and talked about ratchet. What's, what does that mean? And, and I, I was like, I was like, don't, don't use that word. You know, why, like, why are we exporting this stuff, you know, to, you know, these things that are demeaning human beings and we're trying to like turn them into like pop culture things, you know what I mean? But anyway, fortunately I haven't heard the word in like a decade, so. Um, so I would like to build on what Matthew is saying. Um, thanks for sharing Matthew. Um, I would like to say that I think um, we might be speaking, um, we might be speaking a little of like some different um, ideas here. Um, so just to unpack a little bit, I think um, part of the commodification, how you recognize the, com the, commodific the commodification is your def the definition you just shared of ratchet um, is very much different for me and I'm sure for most of the black folks here. Um, and, you know, in many ways, we might speak of it in ways that it comes off with a negative connotation. But um, again, as folks that are oppressed in so many ways, the ways that, you know, we might be, A, sometimes joking, um, like I call myself ratchet um, fairly frequently. Um, and um, it is not necessarily something that means anything negative for me if I were to refer to myself in that way. Um, you know, same goes for ghetto. Um, I think for folks that are not part of the community, um, there's ways of recognizing something that doesn't necessarily belong to you. Um, and the in terms of belonging, um, something belongs to you becomes something that is home to you. Um, sometimes it feels alien, um, but someone who is not from my community saying ratchet feels very oppressive and imposed on me um, in ways that someone from my community, maybe I would, you know, have conflict with them and like get into a fight with them, but it's not the same as them having oppressive power um, supported by a system above me. Um, so I would like to, you know, explore that. Um, and I think that also taps into, so a lot of this work that I'm doing is grounded in womanism. Um, for a similar sense. Um, in many ways, um, feminism forgets about Black women um, and continues to forget about Black women. And, and we are very much not human um, and treated as cyborgs, even within feminism as well. Um, so I think all of those things kind of build on each other. Um, so I would say that it's less about ownership as if to say that a certain community owns something and more about recognition that if you are working to be in, in solidarity with a community and you're not able to access some of their language in ways that you know belongs to you naturally, um, and I'm sure other folks have better word, better ways of framing this, um, that you know there's a way to honor that and to um, recognize that and to allow room for that um, outside of like you know, an outsider's perspective, um, looking in and judging what it is that we are speaking of when we speak to ourselves. Um, 
I can say, for example, one of my favorite ways of exploring the idea of not caring about what society says is to, you know, relay and reclaim, and I'm sure other people might not agree to that, um, reclaim what it means to be like hood. Um, because for me, there's so much empowerment from that. I don't feel like that's outside of myself. And maybe if I once did, that was related to what society told me I was supposed to feel about it. Um, so I see there's some notes in the comments. I'm gonna read those and then open it up if folks have other thoughts. Um, so Shani said, the vaccine example is interesting because I wonder if it would still be a trend if people knew slave traders used um, to oil the skin of Black folks to make them look more appealing and healthier for selling. Um, yeah, exactly. And I think, um, you know, like this example, for example, goes back to, you know, the idea of ghetto and why maybe to us we're saying ghetto because, you know, we're thinking of like, you know, the like these imposed um, realities of being old up in these ways or being in spaces where, um, you know, like maybe back home, like I know for me as an immigrant from Haiti, using Vaseline on all of my skin was not as necessary as it is here in Boston where the weather is very cold and I need more protection. Um, so what does it mean to have to use things differently um, to survive? Um, I'm sure, I don't know if other folks have examples for that. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna read the comments and, and then let folks jump in. Um, Louise said, what about hood hood? Um, it can be neighborhood, culture, good. Um, Ace, Ace did EJ and hood. Um, is mainly black. That was between just the coalition. Okay. Um, could you share more, um, Louise? Um, I wasn't sure what you were meaning to say. Would you mind just um, expressing? No, but, but, like the H is mainly black black organization. We, with the T Riders Union part of us, we're fighting displacement. And this is when we're doing the Green Justice Coalition. Getting, and, and the jobs didn't come to they promised. They kind of failed a lot. What we would try to do in the neighborhood, green justice, weatherization, but if some of the people's houses were old, they had to fix them, there was a lot of problems that way. But we, they termed it EJ in the hood. But some black people didn't like the term hood because when the white people and is given the word hood, it's like a gangster thing. But yet, yeah, neighborhood, but then there's a lot of culture in Roxbury, internal culture. And I know that like, we were thinking of hood as bringing out the, the community, the culture, the good part that's overlooked. And that's what I was thinking, those different terms, two different ways of thinking of, of the word of the hood. Thank you, Louise. Yeah, and, and I think- And I mentioned too, like, mm -hmm. like a redneck. If we can joke about redneck jokes ourselves, but if somebody else comes from the outside, it might be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think if we go back to, thank you, Louise. Um, I think if we go back to the poem from earlier, um, you know, I know at least like in my, you know, high school years, I would have very much described um, the grandmother we were hearing about um, the grandmothers in those poems. Um, those are the grandmas from the hood. That's literally what I would refer to them as. And grandmas from the hood make me feel safe. Um, I'm sure folks have other ways of um, defining them and labeling them. Um, but for me that, you know, and I would say, you know, I probably wouldn't call them that to their face per se, but, um, you know, like the elders from the community, the ones that invite me, um, to try their food, um, that, you know, you know, I, like when I was first going through my divorce, I remember a couple of them would invite me to like cookouts and such. Um, those folks very much, um, bring me back to my community um, and bring me back to feeling more whole. Um, so even though at that point, you know, having been in college and having been um, dealing with displacement and having moved out of Boston, um, being pulled back um, home, um, that resonates with me in that way. Um, I see Shani also said, I think this is an important point about definitions and uses can be used in another community without knowing the history and or, or original definition. Yeah, definitely. Um, does anybody else have anything to add on this? Um, yeah, any thoughts? I also would love to hear people's um, examples of um, 
you know, wisdom that's rooted in um, the, you know, lived experiences of Black women or like everyday and ordinary activities like the vast lane. Um, and let me see. So Matthew added in the chat, this discussion reminded me of a book and interview from the Boston Basic Black show like in 2009 about the word ghetto. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing, um, Matthew. I haven't seen it. Um, if you'd like to share in the chat or in the notes, maybe we can check it out. Anyone else? Uh, can you give an example of, I guess, wisdom rooted in the lives and learned experiences? Do you have one? Yeah. Um, so one that comes to mind, um, when that comes to mind is, um, let me see. Well, actually, let me open it up to folks um, and I will jump into as well. Um, but let me open up to folks so I have a second to think. Um, does okay. anybody have examples? Yeah, thanks Paige. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. So um, one example I could think of is um, Haitian folks make fried plantains. Um, and we normally have these wooden planks that we use to press together to um, flatten the plantains. Um, if you don't have them, you can very much use like the actual plantain skin um, and press it down. Um, you know, it's very, it's very wise. Um, yeah, green plantains. Um, I find that to be very wise because, you know, it's the same tools that it's made with. Um, before um, I know, you know, folks will use like banana leaves for like their meals, um, which are like, you know, just like everyday activities. Um, also, I think a lot of like the ways that black women will like show up at their child's school and like will cuss everybody out um, if, you know, their kid is not excelling. And oftentimes, you know, they're told about like these gaps in like the child's achievement, um, but they know their kid and they know their kid is can succeed. Um, and I believe that if it weren't for those angry mamas that showed up at the schools, we wouldn't realize or recognize how many of these standardized tests are not designed with us in mind. Um, even like the vocabulary in there, um, like the word four years, one example um, of, you know, words that are described as like us having a gap in our knowledge or in our vocabulary, but if you've lived in an apartment your whole life, you've never, ex you don't know what a foyer is and why is that reckon, you know, necessary vocabulary um, to have in school? Mm. So that's an example. Anybody else have any other ones? I'm thinking about like fish fries and um, sort of like um, bake, you know, like things that um, you do to like, um, like rent parties and things like that to help people like if they were struggling with their rent and they would you know people would sell plates out of their houses um in order to like help either themselves or you know like family or community or neighbors um to be able to like stay in their homes that's like the first thing that I could think of as like a technology mm -hmm. use for surviving and thriving. Yeah, for sure. I mean, can you imagine if we just had like rent parties throughout this whole pandemic? Um, you know, um, I, I mean, granted <laughs> pandemic, um, but um, you know, like, yeah, like so many people were dealing with displacement um, and those technologies are very much how bills got paid many times um, and reminded us of community as well. Thanks for that, Tracy. Um, and Matthew added in the chat, um, I can send a link if I find it. Sorry that I got tripped up about something that, that used to irritate me like 12 years ago. I feel like the diversion about the uses of the word messed up the flow of the meeting. It's totally fine, Matthew. We are all here to like co-learn together. Um, it's better to, you know, work through it than to not ask and not move forward in a way that we all feel is effective. Um, yeah. 
any other thoughts on this one? I feel like this is like the biggest exploration um, and um, we do have a session three, so I'm happy to, you know, continue to explore this as much as possible. I think one thing that just came to my head is just um, like keeping houseplants and different, different techniques to help uh, fertilize, keep plants fertilized and thriving. So like taking coffee beans and putting them into the house plants, or I think some people use ice cubes to fertilize their orchids. And some people use like water that their eggs have been boiled in just like very simple daily, um, like things that you can do that you kind of pick up through observation of just like watching someone else tend, tend to something that they care about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I really like that one. I like love plants and in like the fall, I get really like saddened um, when my plants are like dying. Um, but being able to like, you know, plant foods that I'm about to eat or potatoes that are starting to go bad um, by the spring, they're usually like sprouting and really like, at least lovely to look at, even if they don't come into a full harvest. Um, and, you know, like repurposing um, water to, you know, for folks who leave out water for like their ancestors, sometimes watering mm -hmm. my plants, that reminds me to water my plants. Um, <laughs> here's that water that I need to pour somewhere. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, it also those activities, at least for me, offer me a moment of Zen, of like recentering myself, of thinking of doing something that's not ne a necessity. Um, yeah, and Louise um, added in the chat, um, City Live Viva Urbana, right to the city, do eviction blockade. Um, um, Louise, I see your hand is raised. Would you like to tell us more about that? Yeah, because... Yeah, I thought because all groups we, we just get involved, we, we form coalitions like Life of City and like a city like Viva Urbana every Tuesday. Well, Wednesday in East Boston, Tuesday in Jamaica Plant in the Bowie, they have a volunteer lawyers there. They're doing it by Zoom now. And they discuss actions and tenant organizing if people have problems. And they do eviction blockades. Like we did one in Deadly Square, Nubian Square. And the, the woman, they, they made the landlord keep the people there, the woman there, until she could find another apartment. I mean, that's a way to, I think the three lights just the sword and the shield. You know, the, the legal stuff in that. Those are ways to try to fight back and everything. Mm -hmm. But it makes me think of when you talk about the planting stuff and land, they usually have a thing, land poor, uh, land rich and poor. And they say some of the Appalachians sold the buildings that they, they regretted it because they, after they sold the land, they had to pay for water and food. You might not have much, but you're talking about the plant. At least if you have some land, you can make some of your own food. Mm -hmm. Well, even in Roxbury, they're trying to get a community, they're doing a community garden in Roxbury too. Mm -hmm. And things like that. These are groups trying to stop the displacement and want to get more housing out of the nonprofits that have a footless tax, tax landlords that uh, buy a house and sell it right away and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you, Louise. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I know um, City Life, um, Viva Urbana had um, one of their EDs, I believe, was a Black woman. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I don't know much else about it, but I can say that. Um, City Life definitely has been helpful. Um, there is someone that I've been um, working with um, who was working through the foster system and um, was going through like a very unfair eviction and City Life was very help, um, supportive in that process of, you know, them being able to like work through, um, you know, get more accountability from their landlord um, before being forced into displacement as, um, you know, again, someone in the foster system who, um, at that time, I believe was 19, I believe. Um, so they've been really effective in that. Um, and they just remind me um, some of the ways that they approach, um, you know, that work is very much just resistance, um, you know. So it makes me think a lot of like the Rosa Parks um, 
or you know even like in beloved one of the main premises is you know why not in beloved by Toni Morrison which I mentioned earlier I just read beloved so don't mind me um, I just reread it um but you know they mentioned how the house um feels haunted and she says well I'm not moving um and you know there's power in that resistance even if it's sometimes these spaces are trauma filled um choosing to stay and make a way within that space and rebuild and reconstruct um rather than just like giving up I is what is coming to me when I think of like city life and the work that they do um, the had a, a class at equity day and we gave out Rosa Parks Award mm -hmm. and the two Louise, I didn't really fully catch that. Um, Benji, so I'm gonna, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna read um, Tracy's comment and we can try to wrap up here. Um, feel free to put in the chat, Louise, um, what else you were saying, it started breaking up a little. Um, Tracy said that the current um, co-executive director of City Life is a black woman, um, Denise Matthews Turner um, and the former and the former exec um, is also a black woman, Lisa Owens. Yeah, which is what I thought, I just wasn't sure. Thanks for clarifying, Tracy. Um, any final thoughts, ideas um, that folks wanna throw in here and explore a little more? Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paige, I'm gonna mute you. I hope it doesn't stop you being muted. Please send me, please send me a note if it does. Um, it was just um, the sound was going off. Um, go ahead, Francine. Hello. Yeah. Um, as a senior citizen, um, I would like you to think about the evolving of young black women into mature women mm -hmm. uh, via the diaspora, mm -hmm. we're living in more than a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. I can say dichotomy because we are split. Um, we need to connect more mm -hmm. in the diaspora globally. Mm -hmm. And we have a small microcosm right here in Boston, mm -hmm. a global microcosm of black women. Some have sacrificed a lot mm -hmm. and they should really be in touch with young mothers mm -hmm. so that they can teach their young ladies and young men from five years old, um, more communication is way overdue, but we've been so traumatized mm -hmm. as black people and suppressed in every area of our lives. So it takes a lifetime. I am now 85. Mm -hmm. It takes a lifetime to realize what's been done to you. Mm -hmm. And so basically in this new era of technology, which I am up on, thank God, <laughs> I think we're ready, we're over ready. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm so proud of a show like this and also some of the um, other shows um, that are on nationally some of the black talk shows and and the agreeo newspaper and things like that mm -hmm. uh, well news but um that's about all i want to say is that we 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 can do this we really need to work harder in each community and and say that okay globally this is what we really have to do in terms of creating a nucleus mm -hmm. to educate um, on our own, because we're going backward in the school system. I'm a retired teacher. Mm -hmm. And so in order to fight this, we're going to have to really, really regroup and keep this going. 
that's about it. Thank you for sharing, Francine. Um, I very much affirm that. Um, and I can say that that is actually one of the things that called, you know, brought me to a lot of this work is um, not having um, access to um, as much, um, you know, intergenerational relationships and villages in the ways that, you know, displacement, capitalism, and the ways that we are, we experience our present realities doesn't leave much room for that. Um, but, you know, during the pandemic, luckily we've had more space for at least virtually, which has made things more accessible. Um, and I see here that um, Tracy also noted that Black women's gatherings um, are a technology, the Black women's circles. Um, you know, I, I was, well, I haven't been hosting um, Come Through Sis, which is a healing circle that I was hosting um, early in the pandemic. Um, we ended up needing to go on hiatus, of course, because of COVID, but you know, like those kind of technologies are exactly what we need to have access more um, to more of. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to build out more of those spaces um, intergenerationally so we can have these conversations and, you know, gather what we might not have had before. Um, and the last thing in the chat, I see Louise added that um, the T Writers Union had a Transit Equity Day and did Rosa Parks Awards. Um, we still celebrate Transit Equity Day. Um, the T Writer director um, is Black, um, Mella Bush, um, and they're the director of ACE, Dwayne Twindle as well. Um, I'm not sure if I captured that well, Louise, um, but we have about one minute um, to wrap up. I'd like to well, say. His name is actually right, but it's Dwayne Twindle, yeah. Okay, thank you, Louise. You're welcome. Most um, groups, we, we make it, we join with other groups. We end up making coalitions, that's the movement. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, no, I think, I'm hoping that, you know, as we work through these sessions, we can kind of come up with different ideas. Um, one that I think of a lot is like childcare collectives. What would it look, look oh. like to host those kind of spaces? So um, yeah, thank you everyone for having been here today. Um, we ran out of time, but feel free. Let me move to the final slide. Well, where is it? Um, if folks want to take a quick screenshot, um, these are our final reflections. Hopefully we'll get to explore them a little more um, as we work through the other slides um, next month. And my email is at the bottom of this slide. Um, if folks want to reach out to me, I'd love to chat more about this. And this deck is also available in the notes. All right, I'm going to pass it back to the Boss Energy staff. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, you, you can stop the recording, I guess. Um, yes, I'm doing that.